going to start in Ephesians and then we're going to switch over to Colossians fairly quickly. We're not turning to Colossians, we're actually going to turn to Peter. Go to Ephesians first, Ephesians chapter 5. working through families and uh, we talked about how God created man and woman, husband and wife, what they were created for. We talked about how sin came in and corrupted that and that the, the relationship dynamic was skewed. Uh, we talked about uh, at some length, we've talked about <coughs> the marriage relationship and divorce. We've talked about uh, what Scripture has to say regarding the wives, the women in that relationship. Now, we've talked a little bit about husbands. My goal today is to wrap up the marriage relationship so that we can move on to other relationships next week. So uh, in Ephesians chapter 5, we're going to read this pretty quickly, just so we can kind of get back to where we were. So starting in verse 22, Wives, submit to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. Okay, now we've addressed that, right? <coughs> okay, so husbands, that was not for you. Mind your own business. Okay, so now what we're reading is going to be dealing with husbands. So wives, mind your own business, okay? Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. In the same way, a husband should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ does the church, because we are members of his body. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother, and hold fast to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. This mystery is profound, and I am saying that it refers to Christ and the church. However, that each one of you love his wife as himself, and let the wife see that she respects her husband. So we've, we've touched on this a little already. I just want to recap kind of where we ended at the last point, talking about husbands. Uh, we talked about the Greek word for love that is used in this passage. Okay, It is a, a, a basis or a derivative of agapeo, and it means unconditional, okay? And that, that's important for us to understand because God is telling us to love our wives the way that he loves his bride, the way that Jesus loves his bride without condition. This is going to be a love that is predicated on you giving, not them being worthy of receiving, okay? This kind of love is a conscious decision. It's something you choose to do every minute of every day. Okay? We talked about eros, kind of the, the attraction love, that little 
chemical rush that comes into your body that fades, that's not really dependent on you. It's just hormones at work. Crazy at work. We talked about storge being the family love. We talked about phileo, the love that you would have for a friend, much like David and Jonathan had. Now, I just want to touch this very quickly. It's important because God is speaking to men that you have to choose to love your wife unconditionally. Okay? It's not a tit for tat. It, it really isn't. You are called to love your wife regardless of whether or not she is lovely or love-worthy. Okay? The reason I say this, it doesn't address women agapeoing their husbands. I can find nowhere in Scripture where God tells women, love your husbands like, like agapeo. But it does in Titus chapter 2 tell the older women to teach the younger women to love their husbands. What kind of love is that? It's phileo. Be his friend. You know, one of the, the studies that I read uh, said that the majority of men, <coughs> above 80% of men, believe <coughs> that their wives love them. But they don't, they're not real sure that their wife likes them. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, men, I, I don't subscribe to the theory that there is one person out there for you. Before marriage, I don't subscribe to that theory. But after marriage, I absolutely do. Because when you say, I do, that's the one. Okay? Um, I think, you know, oftentimes we use the scripture, consider the cost, because Jesus is giving that in, in relationship to our salvation. But I think it suitably fits for a lot of things we do in our lives. And rushing headlong into an, a, a relationship based on a hormonal charged uh, emotion gets a lot of people in trouble. Okay? Um, because the hormones dissipate. Usually it's about 90 days. Okay? So we have to choose to love based on the love that God has for us, not based on how our wife is acting. Okay? So, um, agapeo. The relationship dynamic here, and, and if you actually, you read the whole context of Ephesians 5, I really don't think that uh, the focus in this passage is really on husbands and wives. I think the focus here is on the church and Christ. Okay? I have long said that I believe that marriage is an illustration of the relationship that God wants to have with us that all the guards are down, all the ugly is visible, that that intimacy, that you can just be who you are because he already sees you for who you are. You're not going to pull the wool over his eyes. He saw all the ugliness, all the bitterness, all the meanness. He saw all of that and still... Okay? Now, let me, let me kind of flip that point over just real quick. Having said that, I think we need to be very cautious in how we speak to our Heavenly Father. Because He still is the Sovereign God. Now, you can be frustrated. You can even be angry. You read the Psalms, and sometimes the, the writers, David, they're angry. But they always remember who God is. Okay? So, husbands, choose to love 
as Christ loves the church. Um, that really puts a, 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 a pretty big responsibility on us. Because you look in the three plus years of ministry that Jesus had. Wow. The church was so very needy. Um, uh, I, I'm amazed sometimes. Uh, if you're not sure about the grace that God has for you, look at the crap that Jesus had to put up with with his own disciples. With the... Um, thousands that he fed. They followed him all the way around the Sea of Galilee to get breakfast. They thought their life was made. Matter of fact, at the end of that passage, it says, and at that point many departed. A lot of them left, and when they realized it wasn't a free meal ticket, Oh, well, I guess we'll go home. That kind of love, that illustrates for us husbands how we are to love our wives. Now, hold on to that thought for a minute. Because 1 Peter chapter 3, go ahead and turn there real quick. I'm going to pick up in verse 7, and I'm actually going to back up a little bit later and read this in context. Uh, so 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 7. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. Since they are heirs with you, of the grace of life so that your prayers may not be hindered. Okay. We pick up a number of things out of this passage. Um, Peter had a, a, a way of speaking right to the point. Okay. First things. Live with your wives in an understanding way. One of the things that we have got to really work at that, I, that just so distresses me is this concept that is out there that if somebody disagrees with you or somebody believes different than you on a particular issue, they're wrong. Okay? I'm the poster child for this. Okay? Because Christy and I are very different people. And she doesn't do things the way that I do things. We don't clean the house together ever. <laughs> ever. Because I have a procedure that I do, top to bottom. When I'm done in the room, the last thing I do is either vacuum or wash the floor. That room is done. Christy doesn't do that <laughs> at all. She goes into the bathroom and starts cleaning and, oh, I need to go get the comet. And on her way out to the kitchen to get the comet, she sees something else. And, and then it all gets done. It all gets done. I come out of my bathroom. It's all done. I look at her bathroom. What, what have you been doing? Okay. Um, Benjamin and I are very different. Um, Benjamin got all of his mother's free spirit and then some extra. And then some extra. <laughs> you know, it, it's taken me 30 years to, to gr get Christy to actually write things down. It only took me about six days to get her from writing them down on 100 different sticky notes posted all over the house to put them on her phone. Okay, and, and now I have no clue what's going on because there's no sticky notes. <laughs> okay. So I wander around the room going, I know I'm supposed to be doing something, but I have no clue what it is. Uh, 
understanding that different is not necessarily wrong. It's just different. Uh, Benjamin and I, uh, back when he was, come here, Benj. Yeah, I'm, I'm going to embarrass you. No, I'm not going to embarrass you. Now, Benjamin, you turn this way. <laughs> Benjamin has incredible gifting. Sometimes I want to just break a couple of his fingers. <laughs> he can pick up an instrument and almost intuitively know how to play it. Um, he picks up a paintbrush and, and he can paint incredible things. He, can, he comes up with things out of his brain that I, I wonder sometimes how it ever achieved organization enough to actually put into effect. But he's got an incredible talent. Now, when he was a teenager, part of the difference between him and I is I like music, he likes noise. <laughs> well, that's, that's what I used to do. You know, to me, it was just loud, and I couldn't understand the words. I wasn't even sure that they were actually using words. And, but I saw something, and we used to go back and forth on this several times. And then I saw something uh, one time, because he, he's, he's very tame in the music he likes to listen to compared to his older brother. As far as I know, what his brother listens to is a whole auditorium full of semi-trucks crashing into each other. That's what it sounds like to me. And they all have the radios on full blast. Okay? But I saw something. I got to see my kids worship to music that I didn't like. And they were worshiping. And I had to step back and rethink my position. Because up to that point, my position was right, his was wrong. That's not music, it's noise. But they were able to worship the Almighty God by listening to that music. <laughs> I was going to just turn the rest of the service over to him and see what he did. <laughs> we have to come to the point where we can understand. We may still disagree. We, we still may be polar opposites on the points of what we, we do, how we do things. Um, but different is not necessarily wrong. It's just different, okay? So that's one of the first things that Peter teaches us men. As husbands, we have got to live with our wives in an understanding way. The next thing that he says is showing honor. Now, what does showing honor look like? I don't know. I know what showing honor to me would look like, but that, I try to honor Christy in, in that way, uh, you know, and, and we've seen, we've read a lot of uh, books on marriage and relationships, and, and we can point to a lot of things that are different between us, but um, she has to show me what honor looks like, you know, because there are a lot of things that I do that for me, that's showing tremendous honor. She's like, oh really? And then there are things that I do that are evidently not showing honor. And you know, you, you can read Christy's face so easy. She, she's not good at cards. Actually, she's very good at cards. She's got, she's got all the luck in our family. I don't even play cards with her anymore. Because how, no matter how good my hand is, hers is better. And, but she has no poker face. If her lips disappear, <laughs> and her eyebrows go up into her head, <laughs> run. <laughs> um, I know at that point, that's the I'm not feeling honored face. Okay? And so we have to study our wives. Watch them. See what lights them up. 
talk to them. Find out, hey, is there some way that I can honor you? Okay. Um, I made, I don't, I don't want to say a mistake, but I was talking with Christy and I said, you know, this, this is where I'm going. These, these are the ideas that I have in my notes. And I said, is there anything that you would add to it from the Bible? And she went, oh. <laughs> so we, we, we talk a lot bouncing ideas because women, I don't get you. I don't. Um, and that's not bad. Okay? Um, it's just different. Uh, a lot of times, uh, Christy has to be my interpreter because there are things I just don't get about women. Okay? Um, like why crying is a good thing. I don't get that. Uh, but evidently, women sometimes crying is a good thing. So, uh, showing honor to our wives, and and there are going to be some things that are consistent across the board, and there are going to be other things that are going to be unique to your wife. Study them, find out, engage with them. Um, you know, when you said "I do," it was an "I do" that echoed through eternity. It doesn't mean uh, once a week you take out the trash and you're done. Okay. Although if that shows her honor, by all means, take out the trash. Okay. Um, as the weaker vessel, now we talked about this previously, this is not a reflection of value. I believe that by design, God has made women to be emotive. <coughs> that they, they look for the emotion in things. Uh, one of the things that I really stress to people when they get married, husbands, um, <coughs> sometimes your wife is going to talk just to work things out in her brain. She really doesn't want you to talk. She just wants you to listen. And that's very hard for men because we're designed differently. We're designed to fix a problem. See a problem, fix a problem. And so when, when Christy uh, you know, comes to me and she starts talking, I, I, I have to ask her. Do you want my input or my ear? And she's getting really good at telling me which it is at the moment. Okay. Um, weaker does not in any way signify lesser. Okay. We talked about um, the porcelain jar versus the brass spittoon. Okay. Um, why? because they are heirs with us of the grace of life. And this goes back to what Paul says, uh, there is neither male nor female, Jew nor Greek, bond nor free. We are all one because we are all in the body of Christ. Okay, now, I, I have a tendency to um, not really pay attention to where my appendages are flinging as I'm like walking down a hall. I'll smack a door as I'm going by and it's like, well, that door's been there 14 years and I still manage to hit it, you know, two or three times a week. Um, you know, I get my, my arms flailing around, but um, Men, God has called us to be so much more than we are. Okay. Um, Paul writes, as far as he's concerned, it's better that you not get married, that you may devote your entire life, your whole life, to serving God. Because when you're married, it's not just yourself that you're looking out for. You're also now looking out for your wife and, and things going the way that marriages typically do. Children, okay? your attention is divided but it still requires our attention, okay? Our first relationship is always between us and God, always. Our second relationship is not between us and our ministry. So how indirectly it is, because what is our first ministry? What is the first ministry of every man? Sorry, second ministry. First is God. The first we minister to God. The second one is our family. If I get up here 
and every single unsaved person that walks through that door walks out saved. And yet my family does not know God. My first ministry is a failure. Okay. Um, men, we have to step up the role of being godly leaders in our households. Uh, we had a, a good conversation Thursday at the brothers meeting on what that looks like. Uh, we all understand uh, you know, that, that we're responsible for providing, we're responsible for protecting, we're, we're responsible for leading, but sometimes you know, when we try to pin down exactly what that is, it's not that easy because it can change from one moment to the next. We are co-heirs of the grace of life. And now here's the, the last point that I want to make here. Do you see what Peter puts at the little end there? Um, women, wives, God has your back. God is looking out for you. Because you see what it says right there at the end? That if we are failing to show honor to our wives, if we are not understanding, if we are harsh, God will not hear our prayers. It's a lot like uh, when Jesus said, you know, you take your gift to the temple, and there you remember that your brother has something against you. You take care of what's important first. You put the, the sacrifice down. You go to your brother and you be reconciled. And then you come and make sacrifice. That same idea is here with our relationship with our wives. If our relationship with our wives is not right, God's saying, stop, 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 I quit. No. Fix this. Then come to me. Okay? So women, when you know we talked about... Um, submitting to your husbands, and, and the concern, rightfully so, because so many husbands, uh, when they read that passage, they're like, yes, you gotta do everything I say. Well, no, that's not exactly what is going on there. Um, God has given you an incredible ministry, first to your husband, and then to your children, and should you be fortunate, to your grandchildren, okay? But um, submitting yourself to your husband, uh, a lot of times, um, that can cause quite a bit of anxiety. Because you have no clue where your husband's going sometimes. Or sometimes you know where he's going and it's not a good place. I want to encourage you, look to Sarah as your example. Okay. Abraham pulled some really stupid things. As a matter of fact, so did his son. Tell him, just tell him you're my sister. Everything will be fine. Twice he did this. Because it worked out so well the first time. <laughs> what happened to Sarah? God intervened directly and saved her. Okay? God has got your back. Men, be very cautious about how you treat your wives. Especially if you have ruts in your married life. You know, those areas that you typically fall into so very easy. Because one thing that we get really good at with this, the most dynamic person-to-person -person relationship in our life, we get really good at finding the buttons to poke. I was trying to get your ear, but it moved. Um, <laughs> We know it's almost like we, we have put ourselves in an endless loop of programming. And, and uh, one of the things that Christy does, bless her heart, that absolutely drives me bonkers. She doesn't hang up the towels properly. <laughs> she wads them. And, and, and I walk into the bathroom and I grab a towel and it's wadded and, and I don't even want to dry off now. I'm going to stay wet. <laughs> but it's not something that she does consciously. You know, I'll stand in the kitchen and, and we'll be talking and I'll watch her and she'll be talking with me and she'll be doing stuff and she'll wad it up. And 
<laughs> now, that actually used to cause problems because I would think, you know, if she loves me as much as she says and she respects me, she would know how much this bothers me. And, and she would know she's just trying to push my button. So I walk into the bathroom and I see a water towel. Christy! <laughs> And by the way, that's the only time I use her given name. When I'm, I'm, I'm annoyed or irritated, usually it's babe or sweetie. Uh, and if she doesn't respond, if I'm not in a bad mood, it's Christine. I know better than to yell Christine when I'm in a bad mood because, because she doesn't like that. So um, she's not trying to offend me. She's not trying to push my buttons, but it has taken me years to get to the point where I can go to the towel and shake it and hang it and not be ticked. You know, um, it's, it's almost become like second nature to me. I just kind of wander around from bathroom to kitchen to bathroom and shake out all the towels and then my day's good. Okay. You guys have your own little areas too. Don't, don't think I'm the only one with those. So, husbands, if you feel like God is not hearing you, if you feel like your prayers are bouncing off of the ceiling, right here, we have a potential reason for this. Examine how you're treating your wife. Now, I'm going to pull all of this together. Women, Scripture says that you are to submit. As a matter of fact, earlier in that passage, uh, Peter tells the wives, shut up. That your husband would be won over by your conduct, not by your words. And that I think that's so important to be in there because God has gifted you with a lot of words. Okay? Speaking will actually give you guys a, a recharge. Speaking drains my battery. Speaking, I, I, the other, I, you know, there's this thing that Christy and McKenzie have that they can spend 45 minutes on the phone and not say anything. So, so what did you guys talk about? Oh, she went to the doctor. Forty-five minutes for a doctor's appointment? Well, no, she was just telling me what the doctor said and what she was... Okay, that's enough. Just leave it at she went to the doctor. Okay? You have a natural tendency to... Okay? Just like a couple verses later where... where Peter reminds us not to be harsh because a lot of times, you know, something that always amazes me is when I see a picture of myself, I always have this almost cranky look on my face. Huh. Yeah, huh. I think somebody's doing Photoshop or something. I, I'm a jovial guy. I'm kind of like Santa. You know? Are you guys laughing at me or with me? I feel your pain. I tend to like to get to the point. Okay? Don't dance around the bush. Just jump right in the middle of it, get my berry, and get out. Okay? Um, as we tend to be harsh, I'm not intending to be harsh. I just, I don't see why it takes 7,000 words to say she went to the doctor. Okay? So, women... You've got to control this. And you've got to control this. <laughs> or however my face normally looks. I don't know. Okay. When we say I do, we are undertaking a commitment that takes a lifetime of work. There's no holidays from it. There, you know, you don't get your two weeks off. Well, I mean, you know, sweetie, can, can we schedule a vacation day for today? Because I don't want to be not harsh. <laughs> you know, there, there's nowhere 
of scripture that we get that. Uh, it takes a concentrated, focused effort to be what the Bible says we are supposed to be for our spouses. And, and trust me, it's work. And you got to keep what happens, and you can't because it's so easy to fall back into those old ruts. You got to make new ruts. You got to make new pathways. Okay? Um, I don't care how long you've been married, Christian. I've been married uh, 31, this year will be 32 years. Um, I'm still finding things out about her. You know? I, you like that? Yeah. Since when? <laughs> I've known you most of your life. I've always liked it. Oh my gosh. Hmm. I did not know that. So now I know to buy her a ring for her birthday. <laughs> um, there is hope in this. Because God has given each of us his Holy Spirit. He sealed us. Okay? We're not in this with, with no power. We're not in this defeated. We, we are in this to the final victory. Okay? And you should be seeing measurable, measurable successes. They should be increasing. Frequency and intensity. Amen? Amen. All right, Father, we thank you for your word. I thank you, God, that you have given us principles by which we can live our lives. That, Father, we might begin to more and more reflect your Son. I thank you, Father, that you have instituted this marriage relationship. And that, Father, you have given us guidelines as to how it should work, how to make it better. I thank you, Father, that you are over us all. That in Christ we have all been given a value greater than everything in creation. I ask God that you would open our eyes to see the love that you desire that we would have for our spouse. I ask Father that you would continue to build in us and make in us new people. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.